Trump has a new defense. You ready? John Eastman did it. Quote, he had the advice of counsel, a very detailed memorandum from a constitutional expert. His new, new, newer, newest lawyer, John Loro, said on Fox yesterday, quote, you're entitled to believe and trust advice of counsel. The same John Loro said on NBC, you have one of the leading constitutional scholars in the United States, John Eastman, say to Trump, this is a protocol you can follow. It's legal. The message got out to our American Goebbels. Laura Ingram says Trump's been charged, quote, for adopting and pressing an unconventional legal view. Even his rivals for the nomination, who seem to be intent on hurting him, are actually helping him. Quote, the president was surrounded, Mike Pence said, by a group of crackpot lawyers that kept telling him what his itching ears wanted to hear. Crackpot lawyers, itching ears, those fit in with what I observed yesterday, which was that the Jack Smith charges and the hints in the document leave Trump with really only one defense. Quote, I'm an idiot. Two of the four categories of charges on which Donald John Trump will be arraigned in Washington at 4 p.m. Thursday afternoon are obstruction charges. And for obstruction, you've got to have corrupt intent. And if you can prove... It was not your corrupt intent, but somebody else's, somebody like, let's just say, mm, for the sake of argument, mm, at random, mm, John Eastman, then you might beat the obstruction charges and undermine the other charges as well. You eliminate criminal intent, or as that lawyer John Loro put it to the blankly nodding anchors on NBC, quote, that eliminates criminal intent. So... First Amendment free speech, out. The attorney made me do it, in. Please enjoy the new Eastman plan. Plan on John Eastman taking the fall. Well, this is clear to pretty much everybody not named John Eastman. It seems to have not yet occurred to John Eastman because his lawyer went on CNN last night and said his client would be happy to cooperate with Jack Smith, but, quote, if by cooperation you mean flipping on Trump or providing incriminating information, then absolutely not, simply because those aren't the facts of this case as it pertains to Dr. Eastman. Sucker! There is only one complication for the new the Eastman made me do it defense for Trump. And God knows this is day three out of hundreds and hundreds of days of this to come. And if he's already on defense number two on day three, who knows where Trump ends up by trial? The complication, though, is that to prove that you broke the law only because you got really bad legal advice, really, 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 really bad legal advice, you will have to testify yourself under oath. And the prosecutors will not ask you, Trump, only about John Eastman, or as we can now call him, unindicted scapegoat number one. The line formed on the right, babe, the line for media to get into the District of Columbia Federal Courthouse, where Trump will be indicted again. It formed before sunset last night. There is still, I suppose, the remote possibility that Trump might think better of the spectacle and the schlep and stay home. Other January 6th defendants have been allowed to appear remotely for such preliminaries. But Trump cannot resist a spectacle. He would march loud and proud in full-on Norma Desmond slink to his own public execution. The complication here is that the Prettyman Courthouse in D.C. has a labyrinthine structure of tunnels and interior back routes. And for all I know, moats. I mean, who can say for sure it doesn't have moats designed specifically to bring a defendant in and out of a courtroom without anybody seeing him except in the courtroom? There will again be no video. It's federal court, no still photography, just artist sketches and no offense to them. But there is a reason that there is a word sketches and another word sketchy.
There is no expectation that we will get a repeat of Miami, where it turned out not to be just a handful of charges, but 37 counts. But the special counsel's office has already proved to have a certain panache going for it, with surprises and a notable ability to mesh legalese with pretty solid narrative writing in its charging documents, so who knows what they're going to do. Thus, after the formal indictment, Trump will be on the hook for at least 44 federal counts and a max of 505 years in prison. Or, or, or more correctly, John Eastman will. I try to stay away from economics here as much as possible. I was told there would be no math, but it turns out Donald Trump shot this country's credit rating to hell with all of this. You may have heard that Fitch Ratings, which is the one that isn't Moody's or Standard and Poor's, downgraded the U.S. credit rating Tuesday from AAA to AA+, enraging the White House and throwing out a red flag to investors that maybe our government debt ain't what it used to be. And in an exclusive, the Reuters News Service has gotten Fitch Senior Director Richard Francis to say something dumbfounding that I didn't see anywhere else that part of the downgrade of our national credit rating owes to the January 6th insurrection. Fitch doesn't like fights over debt ceilings either, but they're not supposed to like fights over debt ceilings. Francis is the one who brought up the coup. Quote, it was something that we highlighted because it is just a reflection of the deterioration of governance. It's one of many Lighten up, Francis. Thanks, Trump. There is only one silver lining in this society's imperceptible but steady multi-decade march towards, in the unforgettable words of the late TV playwright Dennis Potter, everything having a price tag on it. If you threaten the money, the money will come back and kill you. And hidden in that fact may be an unexpected line of action against Trump. The money is not happy about the downgraded credit ratings. And the money is not happy at the moment with Republican parties around the country. I've mentioned before the Republican Party of Michigan is within weeks of actual default and perhaps bankruptcy. The bank account of Minnesota's GOP got down to $53.81 before big donors bailed it out. Politico now reports that Colorado's GOP is facing eviction. It can't pay the rent. Politico quotes the former head of the Michigan GOP, Jeff Timmer, about what's really going on. It shouldn't surprise anybody that real people with real money don't want to invest in these clowns, looking at you, Don, who have taken over and subsumed the Republican Party. And that's nice. And if you're in Michigan and Colorado and Minnesota and you believe in democracy and not fascism, that's nice. But what does Trump care? Apart from the collapse of statewide GOP campaign infrastructure. Well, it turns out Trump really does have the kind of money issues I speculated about earlier in the week. And he will later need that statewide GOP campaign infrastructure that's down to fifty three dollars and eighty one cents. The actual numbers for Trump's Save America PAC are in, and I am hardly a financial expert, but if it began the year 2022 with $105 million, but now Trump's Save America PAC has $4 million, that's less, right? Again, it's legal fees and donor queasiness and that valuable cliche that nothing gets scareder faster than a billion dollars. Those numbers came out in this week's FEC filings, and so did something remarkable, and we won't know for a while if it's going to continue. But Trump's ability to turn his indictments into hard cash may be wearing off. After he was arrested in New York in the Stormy Daniels hush money case, contributions to the Save America Joint Fundraising Committee peaked at just under $4 million in one day and $10 million over a five-day window. But since the new filings here literally provide day-by-day -day data, we now know that when Trump was indicted in Florida by Jack Smith in the documents case, the high water mark for donations was just $1,250,000, and the peak five-day period was only four and a half million. 
half, less than half, if Trump donors are actually tired of the Trump Martyrdom Act, these dreams we have of him being unable to compete for ad time during the election may be far more real than previously imagined. And now, let's return to America's most popular new game, Trumple, and the continuing missing piece of our puzzle, a confirmed identification of unidentified co-conspirator number six. I have to confess, I am more than a little thrown by the idea that Maggie Haberman, Jonathan Swan, and Luke Broadwater of the New York Times have written an entire piece on co-conspirator number six. I guess I'm just grateful they didn't use Trumple. They have a different identification than I do, using materials not available to the rest of us players, and that's Maggie Haberman in a nutshell. They write, quote, a close look at the indictment and a review of messages among people working with Mr. Trump's team provides a strong clue. An email from December 2020 from... Boris Epstein, a strategic advisor to the Trump campaign in 2020, to Mr. Giuliani, matches a description in the indictment of an interaction between co-conspirator six and Mr. Giuliani, unquote. And again, Giuliani is co-conspirator one. Resuming the quote, the email sent on December 7, 2020 and reviewed by the New York Times. In which section was it reviewed? I never laughed so much. The email sent on December 7, 2020 and reviewed by the New York Times was from Mr. Epstein to Mr. Giuliani and Mr. Giuliani's son, Andrew, and had the subject line, Attorneys for Electors Memo. It says, Dear Mayor, as discussed, below are the attorneys I would recommend for the memo on choosing electors. And it goes on to identify lawyers in seven states. Paragraph 57 of the indictment says that co-conspirator one, Mr. Giuliani, spoke with co-conspirator six regarding attorneys who could assist in the fraudulent elector effort in the targeted states and received an email from co-conspirator six identifying attorneys in Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Nevada, New Mexico, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. Those are the seven states in the email that Mr. Epstein sent to Mr. Giuliani, and that was reviewed by the Times, unquote. I had a seat on the aisle for this email. It's not a bad argument. It's good research, but there's just one hitch. In the indictment, co-conspirator one is Giuliani, and the indictment's first description of him after saying co-conspirator one, comma, is, quote, an attorney. Co-conspirator two is Eastman, and the indictment's first description of him is, quote, an attorney. Co-conspirator three is Sidney Powell, and the indictment's first description of her is, quote, an attorney. Co-conspirator four is Jeffrey Clark, and the indictment's first description of him is a Justice Department official, which implies that he's an attorney. Co-conspirator five is Kenneth Cheesebro, and the indictment's first description of him is, quote, an attorney. And co-conspirator six, who Maggie thinks is Boris Epstein, the indictment's entire description is, quote, a political consultant who helped implement a plan to submit fraudulent slates of presidential electors to obstruct the certification proceeding, unquote. That's it. That's all it says about number six. So what? Boris Epstein is an attorney. He, in fact, is usually described in news stories as Boris Epstein, a Trump attorney. He's also a political consultant, but it's debatable which is his primary function, if he has one, Giuliani is described in the indictment as an attorney. Eastman is described in the indictment as an attorney. Same for Powell, same for Cheeseboro. Only Clark isn't, but he's described as a Justice Department official. So if it's Epstein, why doesn't the description of him as unindicted co-conspirator six begin the same way? Co-conspirator six, an attorney. It seems to me that if it doesn't say six is an attorney, that can be reasonably interpreted to mean probably Six is not an attorney. It's not an attorney like Boris Epstein. So I will continue to believe it is probably Bernie Carrick 
who traveled with Giuliani to pressure the state legislators to send in the phony electors and who was described as fetching phone numbers for Rudy and Carrick's professional life has been so dependent on Rudy that the two of them resemble Dracula and Renfield. And speaking of Rudy, it was a bad day to be unindicted co-conspirator number one. Remember the rape and sexual abuse lawsuit against Giuliani earlier this year by his one-time assistant or girlfriend or assistant girlfriend, a woman named Noel, Noel Dunphy. She claimed she had audio tapes of him promising job favors in exchange for sex and throwing around racial and religious epithets. She also claimed he asked her to find people willing to pay him $2 million for presidential pardons, which she said she claimed he would split with Trump. Well, he called her bluff in court. Bad move, number one. A court-appointed reporting agency reviewed the tapes and produced transcripts, and they are out. And let's just say Rudy does not come off quite as well in them as he does in the part where he's an unindicted co-conspirator in the most searing legal case in American history. In the transcripts, Rudy Giuliani is heard saying, insisting, Matt Damon is gay, Michael Bloomberg is gay. No, he doesn't say gay, actually. He uses an F slur instead. He insists Jewish men have small private parts because they don't use them after marriage. And quote, Jews, they want to go through that freaking Passover all the time. Man, oh man, get over the Passover. It was like 3,000 years ago, unquote. But that's the good part. It is Giuliani's repeated claims of, quote, ownership of Ms. Dunphy. That's the, uh, the headline. There is one particularly lurid quotation, and I, I, would, I would read it to you verbatim, but I think in light of where we began today in this edition, I should follow the Trumpian lead and just blame it all on John Eastman. So the key word from Rudy on this section of the tape, a well-known popular word used for a part of the female anatomy, which appears seven times in probably about 20 seconds. I will not use that word. I will instead use the word Eastman. So let me quote Giuliani from the Dunphy tape. Quote, come here, big Eastmans. Come here, big Eastmans. Your Eastmans belong to me. Give them to me. I want to claim my Eastmans. I want to claim my Eastmans. I want to claim my Eastmans. These are my Eastmans. America's mayor, everybody. Also of interest here, and how do you follow that? Well, you go from one boob to another. I wonder if Joe Rogan will blame Eastman, too. Goes out and not only says it's a, quote, fact, unquote, that intelligence agencies provoked people to go into the Capitol on January 6th. Also says Ray Epps, quote, clearly instigated. And I guess nobody told old Uncle Fester Joe that Ray Epps has just sued Fox News for millions for the same crap. That's next. This is Countdown. Eastman's. This is Countdown with Keith Olbermann. This is Sports Center. Wait, check that. Not anymore. This is Countdown with Keith Olbermann. In sports, 37 days ago, Domingo Herman of the New York Yankees threw what was just the 24th perfect game in the 153-year history of Major League Baseball. Today, he is at an inpatient treatment center for alcohol abuse, placed on the team's restricted list, almost certain to not appear again in a Yankee uniform this season, if ever. Herman's survival is obviously the issue at hand, but from a baseball sense and a superstition sense, this underscores the bizarre reality that there seems to be something of a perfect game curse. 
24 perfect games, no one has ever thrown two, and despite the magnificence of the accomplishment, only one-third of those pitchers reached the Baseball Hall of Fame. The first two perfect games were thrown in a five-day span in 1880, and both of those pitchers would suffer arm injuries within one year and have to give up pitching. Dallas Braden pitched a perfect game in 2010. He only won eight more games in his career. Philip Umber pitched one in 2012. He only won four more. And even the great Sandy Koufax could not escape. He pitched a perfect game in 1965, but made only 50 more starts in his career before having to retire young because of injuries. And Hermann's New York Yankees are still having a better week than the crosstown New York Mets. Not only did the Mets punt on their season, trading six of their 26 players at the trade deadline in exchange for minor leaguers, but now they are in a controversy involving one of the stars they dealt away, and either he is making stuff up or team owner Steve Cohen is. Max Scherzer told the website The Athletic that before he agreed to waive the no-trade clause in his contract, he talked to both Cohen and the team's general manager, Billy Epler, about the franchise's short-term direction. Quote, I was like, okay, are we reloading for 2024? He goes, no, we're not. Basically, our vision now is for 2025, 2026, 25 at the earliest, more like 26. We're going to be making trades around that. I was like, so the team is not going to be pursuing free agents this offseason or assemble a team that can compete for a World Series next year? He said, no, we're not going to be signing the upper echelon guys. Scherzer says the owner, Cohen, then told him, quote, exactly the same thing, kind of verbatim. The owner, Steve Cohen, texted the New York Post and to some degree contradicted Scherzer. We will be competitive in 24, but I think 25-26 is when our young talent makes an impact. Lots of pitching in free agency in 24, more payroll flexibility in 25. Cohen seemed to be taking the Mets out of the hunt for likely free agent Shohei Otani this winter, but since clubs can hide behind anti-tampering rules, nobody is going to get anybody on the Mets to say that. If the Mets are really going non-competitive for 2024 and maybe 2025, Cohen is going to have an empty ballpark on his hand. There is a third option, and it is both conspiracy theory-driven and it presumes a sophistication that the Mets front office has rarely shown. Max Scherzer did not succeed in New York. He was powdered in his most important start of last season, then blown out in his only playoff start. And this season, he struggled to be competitive. And he had a no-trade clause. The Mets could have told him what he did not want to hear in order to get him to go away. Still ahead on Countdown, it's 44 years now. I'm 20, I'm on my own as the sportscaster and editor at a 1,000 station national radio network and a minute before my first sportscast, the captain of the New York Yankees is killed in a plane crash. Things I promise not to tell ahead. First time for the Daily Roundup of the miscreants, morons, and Dunning-Kruger effect specimens who constitute today's worst persons in the world. The bronze, Alexis Spiegelman. Sarasota, Florida, County Chapter Chair of Moms for Liberty. I believe that's the group that used to be known as Moms for Hitler. Anyway, Moms for Liberty has now attacked emotional health care. Quote, mental health care is health care. Health care has no place in public schools. The organization explains, while attacking the bipartisan efforts to help kids in this way in Florida. Bipartisan in Florida, but Moms for Hit. I'm sorry, Moms for Liberty opposes it because they say mental health care is just part of social emotional learning and social emotional learning is just part of critical race theory. And of course, that is woke. So they're opposing mental health care. Well, obviously they are. Look how crazy they are. There used to be this running joke on the TV series All in the Family in which Edith Bunker's cousin Maud would look at Edith's husband Archie Bunker and say... Still fighting mental health, huh, Archie? And now people are actually doing it. The runners up, Warner Brothers. Sure, after hundreds of millions of dollars in opening week ticket sales, 
Barbenheimer seemed like a good idea and replying positively to the Twitter mashup of the guy playing Ken, but he's got an atomic bomb hairstyle, and you write, this Ken is a stylist, seemed like a good idea. And then, no Barbenheimer started trending in Japan, and that's when the Warner Brothers publicity department remembered that Sunday is the 78th anniversary of the atomic bomb being dropped on Hiroshima, and Wednesday is the 78th anniversary of the atomic bomb being dropped on Nagasaki, and this whole Barbenheimer thing, and social media images of walls of flames, and mashups of atomic hairstyles, that registers a little differently in Japan. The Japanese Twitter account for Barbie railed at the U.S. Twitter account for Barbie for the atomic bomb hairstyle tweet, and Warner Brothers apologized, and still they have not asked themselves this other question. Why again are we premiering Oppenheimer in Japan two days after the anniversary of Nagasaki? But our winner, Joe Rogan, Uncle Fester, America's leading poisoner of the minds of the especially stupid, Joe Rogan has now explained that, quote, the January 6th thing is bad, but also the intelligence agencies were involved in provoking people into the Capitol building. That's a fact, unquote. Narrator, it wasn't a fact. And also Joe Rogan couldn't tell the difference between a fact and his own ass. However, Uncle Fester may have gone too far this time. He also decided to invoke Ray Epps. Noting others at the Capitol was arrested, Spit for Bain, Rains said, quote, This guy wasn't. All these different things saying Fox News has unjustly accused him of instigating. When he clearly instigated, he did it on camera. I don't know if he was a Fed. I know a lot of people think he was a Fed. Narrator. He wasn't a Fed. But you know what Ray Epps is, Joe? He's extremely litigious. His lawyer has already dropped a few hints. He's already sued Fox for millions, and he's willing to sue Joe Rogan. You guys need any help on this? Please sue him. Please, 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 please sue him. Joe, I'm afraid of vaccine needles, Rogan. Today's worst person in the Uncle Fester world. Just ahead, the anniversary was yesterday, and my annual commemoration of it had to wait because of the press of events, so I'll do it now. Because today, even, 44 years ago, was the day after when we sat there, 51,000 of us still in stunned silence as the New York Yankees tried to process the death of Thurman Munson, their captain. And the day before, as a 20-year-old rookie network sportscaster, I had had to cover it. Next. First time to feature another dog in need. You can help every dog has its day. And for once, not a mention of the word death or asking for your money. Just a dog in need of a family. Theo is 18 pounds. He's a Shih Tzu Maltese mix, maybe. Looks like a giant Maltese with some brown in his white coat. He's five, and he's had a rough couple of years, but he's healthy now and happy and looking for his forever family. He's being fostered in Queens in New York, so an East Coast adoption would be great, and he's probably okay with another dog in the family. You have to apply for him with American Maltese Association Rescue, and you will be vetted thoroughly, but Theo is worth it. I'll post the link and his photo on my Twitter feeds. Theo thanks you, and I thank you. A certain part of me is always living back there on August 2nd, 1979, and the rest of that day is seared into my memory like my name and address. One month earlier to the day, July 2nd, 1979, I had been in the stands in my family's seats back of first base at Yankee Stadium in New York, a 20-year-old Yankees fan applauding Thurman Munson's RBI double and Lou Pinella's two-for-four day and Roy White's appearance, since Roy White was my mother's favorite Yankee player. But Munson particularly, he had been playing for the Yankees since I was nine, I was now 20, thus more than half my life. 
Now, on August 2nd, 1979, I was finishing the first month of my professional broadcasting career. It was my seventh or eighth solo shift anywhere for money. I was the nighttime sportscaster of United Press International's radio network, 1,000 stations worldwide known as UPI Audio, for my first sportscast of the night, due to go at 5.45 p.m., I had long since finished my script. Tom Watson was leading round one of the PGA Golf in Michigan. The lawyer who owned Washington of the NFL, Edward Bennett Williams, he had just bought the Baltimore Orioles. There was an Expos Cubs matinee, a baseball game in Montreal, that prevailed through three rain delays. It was just about 5.43 p.m. Eastern Time, and I was making the short walk from the little sports cubbyhole to the little main on-air studio in UPI World Headquarters in the Daily News Building, or if you saw the movie, the Superman Building on 42nd Street in Manhattan. I was just walking past the bank of thermal printers, each making their sluggish, muted, hung, 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 hung honking sound as they slowly printed stories out onto what wasn't really paper. There was the main UPI wire, the UPI sports wire, the UPI business wire, the UPI international wire, the UPI radio wire, several internal message wires via which the UPI bureaus around the world could communicate with headquarters in New York, or as it was abbreviated, NX. Those message wires were the 1979 equivalent of texting. As I got within a foot of these machines, one of them made a noise I had never heard before, a series of 10 really loud bells. As I moved over to see what the hell they could mean, the news editor, Frank Rayfield, came over to check as well. We saw the words simultaneously. We gasped simultaneously. Cleveland Bureau to NX, Thurman Munson, catcher captain, New York Yankees dead, piloting private plane, Canton, Akron Airport, 30. Still, it stuns me to read those words aloud. As soon as they finished printing, Cleveland sent it again. The bells went off again. I could see I now had about a minute until I went on the air. The editor pointed this out to me. You'll have to ad lib the sportscast, then come out here and do a voice or just talk about his career. Keep repeating that it's a bulletin, that he's dead and that he was piloting a private plane. You know anything about him and planes? And I remember saying, oh, God, I do. And he said, we'll use whatever you think fits. If more details come in, I'll bring them in to you. I'll try to get somebody at the airport for some sound. I don't remember anything of what I said on the air that night, nor in the special report, the voicer, the editor had had me record as soon as I finished that live sportscast. It was all recorded. I never wanted to hear any of it. I never wanted to keep any of it. I have basically the rest of my career on tape, but I knew my youth was over right then. Thurman Munson had joined the Yankees when I was nine years old, literally more than half my life ago. He was the first good rookie I ever saw added to my team. My family was convinced he looked like my mother's cousin, Billy. I met him a couple of times, had photographed him once, interviewed him once. He was gruff and forbidding, but I had never had a problem with him. What I knew about him and his plane, I spoke of as generically as possible. In my mind, I flashed back to lunch in the press room at Yankee Stadium four months earlier when I was still in college with my friend Rick Cerrone, the editor, not the catcher. Munson, Rick said, almost surreptitiously, leaning in toward me over the little table. Munson is flying his own plane back home to Ohio on, like, every day off. The Yankees are terrified. He's not as good a pilot as he thinks he is. Honest to God, one of the executives is trying to get George, that would be George Steinbrenner, the owner, to trade him to Cleveland just so he'll get out of the damn plane. They're all terrified he might wind up killing himself. I don't know how many special reports I did 43 years ago today, in addition to a new sportscast every hour. Later, a friend of mine from college who didn't even know I'd gotten the job as a sportscaster, I was so new there, told me he was driving in Buffalo, listening to the all-news station on the radio. He heard them say Munson had been killed, and with more, here's Keith Olbermann in New York, and he said he almost drove off the road because of the double shock. And I do know my boss, Sam Rosen, 
who did the morning shift and would have only gotten home from it around 1 or 2 p.m., he came back into the office to supervise things and to put together a long memorial special to feed that the thousand stations that used our stuff would all use. I was so glad to see Sam that day. And then he handed me a piece of paper. Those are the home phone numbers for Lou Pinella and Roy White. Call them. Try to do interviews. Be gentle. Record first, ask later. Like Munson, they had played in that game a month before. Really was my last as a fan. Roy White had been with the Yankees since I was six years old. Lou Pinella answered his phone, and somehow I asked him if he would talk to me for two minutes, and he did. And almost immediately, he burst into tears. There was such raw, immediate, brutal pain in his voice. I did the only thing I could think of. I said, listen, you should not have to do this all night. I will make copies of this interview and give it to the other radio networks so they will leave you alone. And only then did I think to ask my boss, Sam, who, by the way, still does the New York Rangers games on TV, if that was okay. And mercifully, Sam said it was a great idea. When I called Roy White, and Roy White was literally on the Yankees the day I became a Yankee fan, he begged me to tell him that they had discovered some kind of a mistake, that Thurman Munson was not dead. Both he and Pinella were blunt but gentle and courteous. And I did make copies of the interviews, and I can see myself handing a cassette to a guy from NBC Radio named Mike Leventhal, who ran a kind of cartel, almost a black market, among New York radio sports reporters. Those interviews, the parts with Pinella and White, not me, were all over radio that day. I also remember discovering, after three or four hours of literally working nonstop, that I had never really known what that meant before. I remember I was supposed to be done at 11 p.m. That was the end of the shift, but I stayed until 1 a.m. and I just rarely made the train, the last one of the night, back to my house. I remember my boss, Sam Rosen, talking to our stringer in San Francisco, a fellow named Rob Navius, and he said, they're killing my team. I should go to Mexico and smoke myself blind. The things you remember at a time of stress and tragedy. In my youthful misunderstanding of how these things worked, I found myself coming back to the thought that I had somehow failed Thurman Munson by not telling somebody about that Yankee fear from April that he was not as good a pilot as he thought he was. Although even then, I asked myself, who were you going to tell? There are two postscripts to my story of the 20-year-old me covering the night Thurman Munson died. 20 years later, I was hosting baseball's Game of the Week on Fox, and I asked my producer what we were doing for the Munson anniversary. He asked, what anniversary? He was younger than I was. I had to explain it to him, even then. You want to write something we can pre-produce, like a minute and a half? Minute and a half. I did it. Didn't think much of it. A couple of years later, I was one of the public address announcers at Old Timers Day at Yankee Stadium, invited by the PR director, Rick Cerrone, the same Rick Cerrone who, in April 1979, told me about Munson and the private planes and the Yankees' fears. It is a small world. The 25th anniversary of Thurman Munson's death was just days away. His widow, Diane, was there. We had never met. Then she saw me on the field and raced up to me and hugged me. That piece you did on him. On the game of the week, when was it, five years ago? That was the best memorial I've ever seen to Thurman. We both teared up. I couldn't believe she said that. I told her about that night in 1979, what it had been like for me. I said I knew it was almost insulting to tell her, but I thought it was important somehow to share. She hugged me again. It was deeply moving, and it is still... The other postscript I only learned of last year. For forever, and the coincidence here with my friend and former boss Sam Rosen being the Hall of Fame announcer of the New York Rangers hockey team is extraordinary, but for forever, the reporter covering that hockey team, the Rangers, for the newspaper The New York Post, has been Larry Brooks. I had forgotten until last year that the year that Thurman Munson was killed, Larry was a very, very young beat reporter covering not Rangers hockey, but Yankees baseball, and somebody sent me a clipping from the New York Post 
from Saturday, July 28th, 1979, five days before Munson's fatal plane crash. It is almost beyond belief. Larry Brooks's story began, quote, reports of Thurman Munson's death are exaggerated at least slightly, unquote. Of course he was using a metaphor. Munson's knees had been giving him trouble and the manager of the Yankees, Billy Martin, was giving him more time off between catching assignments than usual. But Larry's story also included an even more jaw-dropping quote. Asked about the rumors he might not catch again this year, Munson said, I don't know who started them. It was Martin. Asked after the game how his knees felt, he said, quote, sore, real sore. Hey, you might be seeing... My last hurrah. I've done all the damage I can do here. Thank you for listening. Here are the credits. Most of the music was arranged, produced, and performed by Brian Ray and John Philip Chanel. They are the Countdown Musical Directors. All orchestration and keyboards by John Philip Chanel. Guitars, bass, and drums by Brian Ray. Produced by TKO Brothers. Other Beethoven selections have been arranged and performed by No Horns Allowed. The sports music is the Olbermann theme from ESPN2, which was written by Mitch Warren Davis and which appears courtesy of ESPN, Inc. Musical comments by Nancy Faust, the best baseball stadium organist ever. Our announcer today was my friend Richard Lewis, and everything else was pretty much my fault. So that's Countdown for this, the 939th day since Donald Trump's first attempted coup against the democratically elected government of the United States. Arrest him again while we... Oh, right. The next scheduled Countdown is tomorrow. Bulletins as the news warrants. Because he could plead guilty. Till then, I'm Keith Olbermann. Good morning, good afternoon, good night, and good luck.